Hello, hello. Um, so we're going to get started here. Um, it, it feels like a really important time to hear from a visiting writer and thinker and researcher who's uh, fundamentally interdisciplinary, um, working in the sciences and the humanities. Um, I'm not going to say too much about me and Chris because uh, I have invited Brian Jackson, a um, outstanding student in our writing and resistance program, to introduce her. Um, but I want to welcome and thank everybody for coming on this late in the quarter um, week after so much activity has been going on on campus. Um, and I'm just uh, delighted to hear from Brian and some introductory remarks. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I have come to the realization that admir admiration and public speaking causes temporary paralysis of my tongue, so uh, bear with me. In the age of the Anthropocene, crisis level abrogation of key environmental regulations and alternative facts, we as a society exist in a world where truth are not often heard. It is imperative that we have a knowledgeable voice in which to trust, and it is imperative that a gifted voice champion the cause. Me and Chris is a writer in residence in biological sciences at Columbia University. Previously, she was an editor at large at Nautilus and reviews editor at The Believer. Her work has appeared in several syndicated publications such as Scientific America, Science, The New York and The LA Times, Lapham's Quarterly, The Believer, and numerous others. She's also the recipient of the 2015 Rona Jaff Foundation Writers Award, the 2016 AOA Award for Excellence in Health Journalism, a polymath, me and Chris, is her writing is emblematic of her willingness to scrutinize constructs of science, culture, history, personal experience, and communication. Admittedly skeptical of the term, she is quite the compendious storyteller. In an article authored by Ms. Christ in the Atlantic titled, How the New Climate Denial is Like the Old Climate Denial, she wrote something that I found quite intriguing. She states, and I quote, uncertainty has proved a reliable tool to manipulate public perception of climate change. This resonated with me because I believe this to be a succinct societal call to action, a succinct societal call to arm ourselves with knowledge. It is both an honor and a privilege to introduce a literary agent of conscientious creativity and coexistence, me and Chris. Thank you so much, Brian, for that gorgeous introduction. I appreciate it. Um, and thank you to Amanda and Shaw for inviting me here to talk with you guys today. Um, I thought that we might start here. Um, I thought I might read a little bit from a few different things I've written uh, and try to tease out a thread that might be in some way useful to you. So I'll start by reading for about 10 minutes um, from a piece I wrote on sensory deprivation. You'll hear things that you don't normally hear, Zeiger had said as he prepped me in his living room. Your heartbeat, your blood flow. The proprietor of blue light flotation, Zeiger is neither scientist nor clinician, but for the past 29 years, he has hosted a steady stream of floaters and attained something like cult status. The flotation community leans a bit new age, and Zeiger's living room, which smells pleasantly herbal, features floor to ceiling bookshelves lined with titles such as Indestructible Truth, you are the eyes of the world, and the attention revolution. Tibetan prayer flags are draped over a lamp at one end of the brown leather couch. Flotation has seen a popular resurgence in recent years, with commercial tank operators popping up across the country, and I've heard stories both fantastic and mundane about the reduced stimulus experience. It can cure terrible lifelong phobias. It helps with chronic pain. It is a portal to other dimensions. It is relaxing. At first, I cling to the tank, 
fingers splayed and pressing up against the sides. Then I let go. My mind offers this, unmoored. The salt water makes me so buoyant that I float without any effort at all. The darkness behind my eyelids is indistinguishable from the darkness of the tank, but I am naggingly aware of a line along my skin where water meets air. I think about this line and whether I should be thinking about it. Some say that the experience of flotation is similar to meditation, and this is certainly reminiscent of meditation, the mind twitching and fretting like a puppy tied to a lamppost. But the sensory experience of floating is like nothing else. The only sounds come from inside the body, the whooshing rush of each breath filling, then escaping the lungs, the echoing thump of the heart in the chest. At some point, has it been five minutes, 10 minutes, I realize I can't tell if my eyes are open or closed. When I twitch my eyelids to check, the sound of the ensuing blink is a resonant boom. A rumbling begins somewhere behind my right ear, as if a truck is coming around the curve of my head, and as it thunders past, I realize an air bubble has been loosed from my hair. There are subtler noises as well, a regular swish, like the hem of a woman's dress brushing a marble floor, my blood circulating. My left foot touches the side of the tank and my whole body tenses. I use my toes to push off, followed quickly by my right foot bumping up against the other side. I've pushed too hard. Although I can't see anything, I'm acutely aware of the boundary the tub inscribes around me. After a few more bumps and gentle pushes, my body and the water make peace, and I stop fixating on the tank. Then I discover I can't think about the tank. I can't mentally place where the sides might be, or where my body might be in relation to anything else. My brain keeps asking my body, where am I? And my body keeps saying, um, I don't know. This is when I begin to get dizzy. I swear my body is spinning clockwise on the surface of the water, so I prepare to bump the left side of the tank, but I don't. This is wildly disorienting. It's as if the tank has disappeared and I'm spinning in endless space. Because flotation simulates the weightless conditions of space, NASA has used flotation tanks to train its astronauts. But before astronauts and the New Age embrace, there were Cold War fears about brainwashing. The reduced sensory environment of rest grew out of experiments secretly funded by the CIA in the 1950s and 60s on what was then termed sensory deprivation. In the early 1950s, remarkable video footage surfaced which showed American GIs taken captive in Korea, denouncing capitalism and imperialism, prompting the CIA to ask, how could these extraordinary confessions have been extracted? The intelligence community suspected a powerful new mind control technique. In a sensational and hugely popular book published in 1951 um, called Brainwashing in Red China, the journalist and secret CIA propagandist Edward Hunter proposed the term brainwash, a literal translation of the Chinese hiss now to wash brain. If communist powers had figured out powerful new mind control techniques, then Western powers needed to catch up. It was a psychological arms race that could only be run by scientists studying the human mind. The CIA's interest in sensory deprivation as a potential mechanism of brainwashing was sparked by the illustrious, illustrious psychologist Donald, Donald Hebb of McGill University. Hebb is best known for the famous dictum, cells that fire together wire together, referring to a theory about neural mechanisms now foundational to modern neuroscience. Less well known is the fact that he attended a secret meeting at the Montreal Ritz-Carlton on June 1, 1951, along with high-ranking representatives from the defense departments of three countries, Britain, the United States, and Canada. At this meeting, the question of brainwashing was raised. Hebb, then chair of the Human Relations and Research Committee of the Canadian Defense Research Board, speculated that prisoners might be more malleable if placed into isolation with limited sensory input. The others were impressed. Three months later, he began research funded by Canada's Department of National Defense and carefully monitored by the CIA um, into the effects of sensory deprivation. As Alfred McCoy reports in A Question of Torture, CIA interrogation from the Cold War to the War on Terror, within the intelligence community, one stated goal of the research was to prepare soldiers taken hostage and subjected to mind control techniques. Hebb published the results in a 1954 issue of the Canadian Journal of Psychology under the guise of a study on monotonous environments, such as those experienced by long-distance truck drivers. 
The experimental setup have designed looks very little like today's flotation tanks. 22 male student volunteers were paid $20 a day, twice the average daily, rate, daily wage, to lay on a bed in a chamber designed to induce perpetual perceptual isolation. The students wore a translucent plastic visor that emitted diffuse light to prevent pattern vision, as well as cotton gloves and cardboard cuffs that went from eldo, elbow to fingertips to reduce tactile stimulation. A U-shaped foam rubber pillow helped dampen auditory stimuli, but an air conditioner in the ceiling remained on 24 hours a day, emitting a steady hum of white noise. The students were allowed breaks to use the bathroom and eat meals, which many ate sitting at the foot of the bed. They were invited to stay as long as they liked, but most could not make it past two or three days. The results were startling. Students' cognitive skills deteriorated rapidly, and most experienced powerful hallucinations. As one of Hebb's graduate students, Woodburn Heron, wrote in a 1956 issue of Scientific American, quote, our subjects' hallucinations usually begin with simple forms. Then the visions become more complex, with abstract patterns repeated like a design on wallpaper, or recognizable figures, such as rows of little yellow men with black caps on and their mouths open. Finally, there were integrated scenes, e.g. a procession of squirrels with sacks over their shoulders marching purposefully across the visual field, prehistoric animals walking about in a jungle, processions of eyeglasses marching down a street, end quote. Some subjects experienced auditory or tactile hallucinations as well. Quote, one had a feeling of being hit on the arm by pellets fired from a miniature rocket ship he saw, end quote. Many participants refused to finish the experiment. Researchers now recognize that many of the dramatic effects of Hebb's research were not the result of reduced stimulus per se, but to monotonously repeated overstimulation, the light advisor, the white noise, even the pressure of the bed against the back. But the study became recognized as a landmark invest investigation into sensory deprivation. And sensory deprivation continues to be associated with torture obscuring the fact that dramatic negative effects such as hallucinations, intense anxiety, and mental breakdown are not merely a result of restricted sensation, but of how sensation is manipulated and under what circumstances. So this piece goes on to explore a common but poorly understood twilight state, uh, a sort of phase of consciousness between waking and sleeping. Um, as well as how research into what is now known as sensory deprivation contributed to the CIA's infamous interrogation training manual known as QARC. Hebb, to his credit, got out early. When I first read about his studies, I was struck by the way this research could evolve in two such different directions. Um, on the one hand, you have health and relaxation, and on the other, torture. I was also really struck by that sentence about the marching squirrels and processions of eyeglasses. <laughs> um, just the specificity of the images and how the subjects made so much of so little because they were subjected to monotonously repeated overstimulation, the light advisor, the white noise, the pressure of the bed against the back. The brain is a meaning-making machine. And as a writer, I'm both fascinated by and skeptical of the ways in which our minds ache to make order out of chaos parades of squirrels and eyeglasses out of the white noise of life. As a nonfiction writer, I constantly find myself wrestling with what I know or what I think I know and how to say something true about the world. Um, this piece, which appeared in Nautilus, is structured around the narrative of my experience in the flotation tank. Uh, so it serves as a kind of clothesline throughout with bits of research and stories and interviews uh, sort of hanging off of that main story to which the piece repeatedly returns. Uh, there are sections that are many paragraphs long and others that are only a single sentence. This is a structure that I'm often drawn to because it's so flexible. It allows for science and history and politics to jostle around with experiences as intimate as the feeling of an air bubble escaping through your hair. I'm also drawn to this kind of form because it allows for a multiplicity of epistemological approaches, different ways of knowing, different kinds of logic to work in concert. Um, so in the preface to The Strange Case of Rachel Kay, which is this compact, brilliant little gem of a piece of fiction, um, Rachel Kushner writes, 
Writers who have rejected logic and science, those galloping horses, take a different path through coincidence, the cunning of reason, and mystical signs pointing in the direction that is to be taken. Kushner is a writer of fiction, describing perhaps the logic of poetry. It is an intuitive logic of association and accident. It is not, it should be said, for the most part, the logic of science. Uh, when writing is going well, I'll sometimes follow a leaping train of thought to see where it leads and end up in places where I never could have planned to arrive. When editing, because I can't hold a whole draft in my head and I can't see the whole shape of it on my computer screen, uh, I'll sometimes print it out and spread the pages out on the ground uh, and then cut it up using scissors and tape to rearrange bits of text to just see what happens. Um, these writing and revision processes are fundamentally intuitive, as a path, as Kushner might say, through coincidence. But I do not reject, as she claims to do, the galloping horses of logic and science. To the contrary, I'm captivated by their speed and predictive power, itching to hitch a ride, to map the landscape as it goes whistling by. What interests me most is how the tension between these two ways of knowing, the rational and linear logic of science and the intuitive logic of poetry, can generate writing informed by the overlapping and conflicting human desires for order and certainty on the one hand, and the destabilizing and fundamental human experience of uncertainty, the unknown or perhaps the unknowable on the other. As in life, this tension can't be resolved, but in writing, it can be generative. So I'll read a little, about 15 minutes, uh, from an essay called Dissection, which appeared in Lapham's Quarterly. Uh, this is the image that the editors chose to accompany the piece, It's Autopsy by Enrique Simonet, painted in 1890. I'll start at the beginning, but I've edited out a little bit uh, to make it more amenable to hearing out loud. Uh, and there are a lot of white spaces between sections, kind of in that form I was just talking about, so I'll try to pause so you can tell where those white spaces are. The face lies exposed under fluorescent lights as expert hands place the edge of a serrated blade against its forehead. Do they call it forehead in the dissection lab? The word is too familiar, too human. In the lab, body becomes cadaver, and yet the students assign names. Eve, Johnny, Marco. The dead are stripped of identity somewhere between donation and distribution, then given new identities over the course of a semester of cutting. There is intimacy in dissection. The cadaver rocks back and forth on the table, the sound of metal against bone, dust flying. The cadaver is turned over to reveal the back of the head so the blade can continue the cut like a kitchen knife working around the pit of a stubborn avocado. The face is pressed against the table, oh God, the nose, as the white-coated professor leans his weight into the work. It's not easy to saw through bone, even the few millimeters of the human skull. I hold my breath as the top of the skull is removed. Skull cap comes to mind. The spinal cord is stripped, is snipped, and gloved hands reach in to grasp the wrinkled gray meat of the brain. I long to hold a human brain in my hands, to know the weight of it. For years, I've studied the organ at a remove, in theory, drawing, and photograph. It started with the popular science books and glossy magazine articles, which led to the more rarefied world of scientific papers and journals, dense texts not meant for communication of ideas so much as proclamation of data, littered nonetheless with an accidental poetry that is perhaps inescapable when the subject matter is the meat of the human mind. I started going to conferences and filling notebooks. I visited research labs where eager graduate students slid subjects into million dollar scanners that boomed and clanged like garbage can marching bands while rendering technicolor images of neural activity. Curiosity long ago gave way to obsession. But the physical object of the brain itself remains elusive. None of this is easy to explain, but among the forms on the stainless steel dissection tables, white sheets tracing the profiles beneath. No one asks me why I've come. These are all anonymous donors, mostly from Westchester, says the lab manager. It is late on a Monday night, and the only other person in the room is a diligent medical student hunched over the homework of an exposed foot. Leathered skin has been peeled back to reveal a tangle of tendons and arteries. 
The rest of the cadaver is hidden under the drape of white sheet. As a rule, only the necessary parts are uncovered at any given time. They do the head last, because by then students will have become more familiar with their materials, and the face will be less alarming. They used to come from the public morgue, Bellevue, but that's all different now. Before the poor and the insane, there were the poor and the criminal. In the 1700s, those condemned for murder were regularly given sentences of death and dissection, whisked away after execution like so much rotting gold to anatomists willing to pay for raw materials. No preservatives, no fixatives. They had to work fast. But why wait for fresh bodies when you can make them appear at will? After a particularly grisly case revealed that one string of Scottish homicide victims had been surreptitiously spirited directly from crime scene to dissection table, Parliament passed the Anatomy Act, which expanded anatomists' potential pool of cadavers beyond executed killers. There were other attempts at regulation in countries where the practice was legal, but demand moves the market more readily than the law. The courts could not provide the growing number of medical schools with the growing number of bodies they needed. So well into the 1800s, grave robbers known as resurrectionists thrived on the demand for fresh corpses. These were thieves skilled with, rubble, with shovel and rope who could fish a body from a fresh grave, strip it, and stuff it into a sack for delivery within hours at medical school back doors. Across Europe and America, anxious families watched over the bodies of loved ones after they died. They fortified graves with iron bars. Today's medical students deconstruct the bodies of innocents, electricians and painters, accountants and teachers, often doctors. At the turn of the 20th century, doctors were frequent donors because they knew the problems of shortage firsthand. They urged their students to donate as well for the good of those who would someday stand at the same tables, books open and scalpels poised. Doctors are still more likely than others to donate their bodies for medical dissection, perhaps because their own schooling has impressed the need upon them in spite of the violence the lab can do. But why think of it as violence? Doctors in training need to become familiar with the material of their art. Moving along the silent rows, I ask myself if I would give my body to medical dis dissection. My driver's license attests willingness to offer parts of me, heart and liver and lungs. Why not all of me? There is value in the act. Being gone in death, why should I care what happens to what is left behind? Being here, I can no longer put the question aside. There's a shortage of cadavers in this part of the country, I'm told. Medical schools are barely making do. I ask how many donations the lab gets on average. Anywhere from one per month to 30 or 40 for the year. We're counting on the cold season, the holidays. Over there, a lawyer, perhaps. Over here, a housewife, a retired professor, an alcoholic, a grandmother. They are none of these things now. They are bone and muscle and tissue. They are bubbling yellow fat that must be scraped away to reveal internal structures. At the far end of the room is a collection of plastic tubs, like the glass jars you'd find holding combs in a barber shop, but holding dissected brain parts for next week's neuroanatomy class. They're labeled with the names of structures, thalamus, vascular system, brain stems. There's comfort in naming the parts of a whole because the function of the parts can help you explain the function of the whole. There you can say, that's what it's called. That's why it happens. Once you can name a thing, you can call it into your mind at will, turn it around, flip it onto its back. There is power in this. Western science is built on a tradition of great appetite for power and I'm undoubtedly a product of this tradition. The earliest lesson in dissection comes not from the West, but from the East, in the pages of the Sushruta Samhita, an ancient Sanskrit text meant for the students of the surgical arts who probably lived about 600 years before Christ walked the streets of Galilee. It instructs its readers to find the body of a person, not too young and not too old, who has not died of poisoning or severe disease. Remove the intestines, Wrap the body in grass, hemp, or bast, the inner bark of trees. Place the wrapped figure in a cage for protection from animals and lower the cage into a river with a gentle current. Leave it there, bobbing in the rhythmic rush of water, the body left to soften. When you return a few days later, bring a brush made of grass roots, hair, and bamboo. Use the brush to remove one softened layer of the corpse at a time. Quote, 
When this is done, the eye can observe every large or small outer or inner part of the body, beginning with the skin, as each part is laid bare by the brushing." End quote. In this way, you will travel beneath the skin and through the body to the very core, whisking away bits of bloated flesh until nothing is left. The body disappeared and your hands empty. Wearing a pair of blue surgical gloves, I head for the closest tub and pull the lid off, peering down through a noxious burst of organic decay, organic decay and chemical fixative. It smells like a refrigerator that held rotting chicken a bit too long before being scrubbed with heavy solvents. Inside the opened mouth of the tub, the surface of yellowish liquid is broken by the warp and wend of cortical ridges, the rest of the cerebrum obscured beneath. I reach in, the chemical cocktail creating warm suction against the skin of my gloves. The brain is more solid than I expected, heavy and plant-like, but at the same time more delicate. I'm afraid that if I hold it wrong, something will fall unsupported out of place. I use both hands, moving gingerly. Here's the truth. When I saw the serrated blade working into the dead man's forehead, something in me rebelled. It looked wrong. To saw into a human head goes against an instinct buried so deep I hadn't even known it was there. No wonder medical students are taught to think cadaver instead of body. They could not do their work otherwise. There is judgment that must be overcome to stick knives and fingers into human flesh. What did the English physician William Harvey have to overcome in order to dissect the bodies of his own father and sister? Harvey became famous for his descriptions of the circulatory system just 64 years after Vesalius's death. Anatomical knowledge he could not have unearthed without the help of the cadavers he found so loathsome and yet so practical. But his own father, his sister, what cultural and religious pressures did he have to resist as he cut into that familiar flesh? What personal demons did he have to keep at bay? It seems unscientific to think of the body in terms of the sacred, but perhaps for me the associations are unavoidable. The idea of soul woven into the fabric of my mind, into neural patterns strengthened by years of mass and Sunday school. The flesh of a crucified man hung over us, fed to us, Stories told over and over, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. They did not teach us about heavy and learning, connections between neurons made strong by the power of repetition. So I am left, years after I stopped going into churches with anything other than aesthetic interest, with the feeling that the body is a vessel, and that to use the body otherwise is somehow sacrilege. And yet, how easy it was to let reverence make way for curiosity. Uh, and it continues from there. So, Susan Sontag once said of Roland Barthes, uh, it was not a question of knowledge, but of alertness, a fastidious transcription of what could be thought about something once it swam into the stream of attention. This seems to me a useful heuristic for thinking about the nonfiction form of the essay. I'm interested in how the stream of attention flows, how we do and do not control it, how we deal with contradictory or conflicting thoughts, and how different truths might arise given different qualities of attention. But just because something can be thought does not make it true. This brings us back to the logic of science. There is a material reality to the world, a baseline of fact that the logic of science is particularly suited to sussing out. I don't mean to suggest that science is a rigid or essentially dogmatic way of knowing. Science is a cyclical process by which wonder inspires discoveries that coalesce into dogma, then disrupts that dogma when new mysteries demand it. The most beautiful experience we can have, Albert Einstein wrote in Ideas and Opinions, is the mysterious. It is the fundamental emotion which stands at the cradle of true art and true science. In his formulation, whoever does not know it can no longer wonder, can no longer marvel, is as good as dead and his eyes are dimmed. <coughs> In this way, in both writing and science, the impulse toward wonder is also an impulse away from the tyranny of certainty. As James Glick writes in his introduction to Richard Feynman's character of physical law, physicists had hands-on experience with uncertainty and they learned how to manage it and to treasure it. For the alternative to doubt is authority against which science fought for centuries. 
So here are a few graphs um, from that piece that I recently wrote for The Atlantic. There's been a su subtle shift recently in the rhetoric of many conservative pundits and politicians around climate change. For decades, the common, refrain, the common refrain has been flat out denial, either that climate change is not happening or that any change is not caused by human activity, which is why viewers might have been surprised to see Tucker Carlson of Fox News nodding along thoughtfully on January 6 as climate scientist Judith Curry, a controversial figure in climate science, explained, Yes, it's warming, and yes, humans contribute to it. Everybody agrees with that, and I'm in the 98% of people who agree. It's when you get down to the details that there's genuine disagreement. Carlson immediately turns to the camera and moots a multi-part series. What do we know? What don't we know? This rhetorical stance, yes, climate change is real, and yes, human activity is implicated, but we don't know how much human activity is to blame, is fast becoming the go-to position for conservatives. In confirmation hearings last week, Senator Ed Markey asked Scott Pruitt, Trump's pick to head the Environmental Protection Agency, if he agrees with Trump that global warming is a hoax. Pruitt, Pruitt replied that he does not. But later, under questioning by Senator Bernie Sanders, Pruitt refused to say how much change may be caused by human activity. He would only say that, quote, the climate is changing and human activity contributes to that in some manner. When pressed by Sanders on whether he agreed with 97% of scientists who have published in peer-reviewed journals that human activity is the fundamental reason we are seeing climate change, Pruitt equivocated. I believe the ability to measure with precision the degree of human activity's impact on the climate is subject to more debate. The key phrases in Pruitt's testimony are in some manner and with precision. These allow Pruitt to acknowledge climate change is happening while moving uncertainty downstream into the details. This rhetoric is, of course, out of step with the latest science. The most recent IPCC report expresses 95% confidence that humans are the main cause of most global warming observed since the 1950s. According to one paper summarized on NASA's global climate change website, 97% or more of actively publishing climate scientists agree climate warming trends over the past century are extremely likely due to human activities. The list of scientists and agencies in agreement goes on and on. Some conservatives have introduced uncertainty by suggesting climate change might be driven by natural global cycles. But according to Maureen Ramo of Columbia University's Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, we know why climate changes naturally and non-human activity can't explain the rapid changes observed in the past century. The ice ages happen due to subtle changes in the sun-earth distance that unfold over thousands of years and which can lead sometimes to rapid climate change when crossholds are threshed, or thresholds are crossed. Sorry, that was a quote. These cycles are still happening, but, quote, the same factors that cause these things uh, that caused these huge ice age swings could not possibly be invoked to explain the warming we now see, end quote. In fact, Ramo said, left to its own devices, right now Mother Nature would be making the climate colder. The planet has warmed by about two degrees Fahrenheit since the 19th century. Quote, you can quibble about tiny bits, said Ramo, but the vast majority of what we observe is that it's because we've been combusting fossil fuels. As Gavin Schmidt, director of the Goddard Institute for Space Studies and principal investigator for the GISS Model E Earth System model put it, in science, nothing is ever known perfectly. There is remaining uncertainty. Is there remaining uncertainty about the exact value of gravity? Yes, but to something like the fourth decimal place. It doesn't matter. So the question is, is the remaining uncertainty around climate change relevant to any policy decision anyone would want to make? And the answer is no. Uncertainty has, pro has proved a reliable tool to manipulate public perception of climate change and stall political action. In 2015, the Union of Concerned Scientists released the Climate Deception Dossiers, which describes a 1998 memo from the American Petroleum Institute that, according to the dossiers, quote, mapped out a multifaceted deception strategy for the fossil fuel industry that continues to this day, outlining plans to reach the media, the public, and policymakers with a message emphasizing uncertainties in climate science, end quote. The UCS authors write that the memo included in the report states, victory would be achieved, quote, 
when average citizens and the media were convinced of uncertainties in climate science despite overwhelming evidence of the impact of human-caused global warming and nearly unanimous agreement about it in the scientific community, end quote. Another victory listed on the API memo's bullet point list would be when, quote, those promoting the Kyoto Treaty on the basis of extant science appear to be out of touch with reality, end quote. So, yay science. Um, I thought I would end on something a little bit more playful. Um, so, I've been writing these tiny little 10-point essays um, using OED definitions of words. And so, sort of looking at the thesaurus and looking at the various words that sort of come under the heading of a single word. And this 10-point this form was sort of inspired by um, Jeffrey Jerome Cohen's Monster Culture, Seven Theses, which many years ago inspired a friend of mine to write a poem uh, that he called Monster Theory. And this is sort of like an academic form, the, the, the numbered, bullet-pointed sort of theses. Um, and I liked the idea of starting with a constraint and sort of seeing where I could go, not knowing um, what would happen. So I'm going to break all the PowerPoint rules about not putting lots of text on a slide. <laughs> and I'm just going to put the whole thing up so that you can see what the form looks like and uh, read along if you want. Ten thoughts on pattern. One, the pattern as a model for making dresses has never held much appeal. Two, why then does the pattern as blueprint so easily seduce? Is it because it suggests a set of skills more technical, more difficult? Competence always has value, so why does blueprint excite in ways that model does not? Three, pattern is also design, which implies a plan one follows, but also ornamentation for what has already been made, as in a motif, repeated. Four, repetition here is key, whether building from blueprints the same model boat now to scale or the iterated flourish as in late motif. Five, the late motif is a system for making meaning out of noise. If nothing else, the pattern makes order from chaos. Six, iteration is repeating a method to get successively closer approximations to the solution of a problem. How close you get depends on whose method you choose. Seven, pattern, of course, can also mean method, how to spin the silk that will make the dress best practices in caterpillar husbandry. Eight, but method, like design, can mean both systematic planning and systematic action. The distance between the two is the difference between a clutch of dead moths and a skein of silk, between blueprints for a boat and building one that floats. Nine, because pattern predetermines form, it tells you ahead of time how the whole waterfront will look. This may be comforting or terrifying, depending on how you feel about the placement of potted plants and the width of slips. 10. Perhaps the resistance to pattern as model is this, the fear that someone else is patterning my life, as in shape, influence, mold, style, determine, control. The problem is that planning and doing can so easily be confused. Um, so just to give you a little sense of the words that are italicized were the words that I was using from the OED definition. And that little phrase, um, the fear that someone else is patterning my life, that was one of their examples of how to use the word. <laughs> um, like I really got really excited about the examples that the OED uses, and they're very strange, some of them. Um, one for uh, illusion was, he had no illusions about the trouble she was in. Um, so anyway, I've written a bunch of these. They're really fun. I, I didn't sit down intending to write a piece about frustration around heteronormative gender conventions, <laughs> but I think that's actually what I ended up writing. Um, and if you see other things in that, that's great. I mean, there's this idea that meaning can arrive after language, and we're talking about forms and methods and ways of making meaning, and this was an attempt to sort of not predetermine a meeting, but sort of let a meaning come out of whatever the language did. Um, so this leads us to the end. So I thought I would read you 10 thoughts on ends. Um, one, at the edge, limits are made known. 
Two, some limits can be seen a long way off, a wall, an ocean, a sickbed already sour with death, but they can also surprise, just one straw breaking the camel's back. Three, of course, a wall may be scaled or an ocean crossed, but be wary, as there may be men with guns on the walls, pirates on the ocean. It's hard to tell sometimes if breaching the boundary is worth the risk. Four, some limits are best respected. These belong to you and may be recognized as climax or coda, though sometimes they are simply tip or tail. Five, some limits leave no choice. Stale breath, curtains drawn. Watery eyes are an ocean from which no one has yet returned with tales of adventure. We are still waiting for word from the last party who went that way. Six, and yet it is tempting to ride up to the edge, to steer your camels to the desert's end, to call and end ambition. This too is yours. Guard it with your life. Seven, discoveries are only made by riding into the sun or sailing off the edge of the map. Eight, Choose your map with care, as there will be different demons to face, depending on direction. Some are worth fighting, others not. Nine, the demons you don't want to fight are almost always hiding in plain sight. Remember this and keep your best woman on lookout. Steer clear of shoals in shallow water. The demons there will puncture holes with tiny claws that let water drop by drop. That's no way to go down. 10, seek deeper waters, better demons, hope for tentacles and teeth. Thank you. <laughs> questions maybe? Yeah, I think we have some time for questions. I will try to answer them. I can kind of see you and kind of not. Um, so wave. You're waving, but I think you're actually just waving. <laughs> Great, hi. <laughs> Any questions? No questions? That made sense, really? Wow, okay. I'd love someone to explain it to me. <laughs> Uh, some of both, it depends on the, the piece. Um, sometimes things are brewing for a long time and then I'll find an appropriate place to sort of put them in the world. Uh, so like that, the dissection piece, I had been sort of looking at um, things to do with neuroscience and I was investigating a, a whole other sort of project that had to do with traumatic brain injury, but I was reading all this history of science and then I went to this dissection lab and was really just kind of taken with the experience. Um, and an editor contacted me and asked me for an excerpt from that larger project, the traumatic brain injury project, and I, it was under contract so I couldn't give out pieces of it, um, and so I lied and I was like, I have this other essay though <laughs> uh, on dissection because it was something I'd been thinking about and she was like, oh great, I'd love to see it. And I said, well, um, you know, give me a week and I'll, I'll get that to you. <laughs> um, so I sat down and I, that's maybe the fastest I've ever written a piece. I wrote that in a week, but I had been thinking about it literally for years. Um, and so all of that material had been kind of digested and was in there. And so I used the, the sort of assignment as a prompt kind of thing. Um, sometimes like I do a lot of, um, you know, literary criticism and book reviewing, and those are often, you know, an editor will say, hey, could you review this for us? And it's a book I haven't read and, or a writer I don't know. Um, and so I'll like jump into that world for a minute. Um, yeah, but most of them, most of them are, they come from somewhere, from something that I'm sort of working on or something I noticed. The Atlantic piece uh, came from the fact that I was at the gym <laughs> and like walking angrily on the treadmill watching Fox News and w saw this strange interaction between Tucker Carlson and Judith Curry and was like, what, what just happened? And I, I didn't understand it. And so 
often not understanding something is what prompts me to begin researching or investigating and then writing. I'm, I'm often interested in things I don't know or don't understand. I just, I couldn't understand the action, the interaction I'd just seen um, on the news and I wanted to kind of try to wrap my head around it. So the question is, how, how, like, do I think about audience? Or the, the original question was interesting, the phrasing was, how do I choose my audience? And my answer to that is, I don't. Um, you know, whoever reads what I have written somewhere, however they come across it, is the audience. Um, the pragmatic answer is also sometimes it's a publication. You know, so the readership of The Atlantic is going to be probably a certain kind of readership, and the readership of you know, a literary magazine like Tin House is probably gonna be a certain kind of readership, and you have different degrees of sort of freedom and flexibility and control um, when speaking to, to those aud like audiences of publications, if you are writing specifically for them. Um, so again, it kind of depends on the piece. Because I write a lot of different kinds of, of pieces, um, I, I don't really have like a good simple answer. Sometimes I just write something, and then if I like it and want to put it into the world, I sort of poke around and look for a home for it. And so I haven't really thought of who the audience was. The 10 pointers, I actually started writing them as gifts. Um, I wrote one on mother, one on father. I had a niece born, her name was Lena, so I wrote one on Lena. I found out that Lena is the name of a basin in the Laptev Sea, and it has all this interesting things to do with like gold and basins. And um, So th those had an audience of one, <laughs> um, the, gift, the, the person for whom they were written. Um, and then sometimes like the, the, the Atlantic climate piece, I was, um, you know, feeling all the feels after the election and I wanted to put that energy somewhere and I was angry at what I was seeing in these confirmation hearings and so I sort of like channeled that energy toward an audience that I thought could hear it. Um, I hope that's helpful. Other questions? Yeah. That is such, that's like the question, right? <laughs> Um, the answer is I have another job. <laughs> um, so I have this job as writer in residence in biological sciences at Columbia University. So I, it's a full-time job where I work in the biology department. My home department is biology department, and I teach PhD students uh, how to write about science for, a, to, for an audience of other scientists. Um, and I'm sort of like a writing therapist for scientists, and so, you know, PIs and the pr primary investigators, is a, scientists will come to my office and, you know, postdocs and people will sort of, I, I give them help writing. Um, I also teach in the creative writing program. Um, and I also have sort of built into my job time for doing my own writing. Um, and that's really rare and really lucky and not how it always was. There were years where I was, uh, I lived in artist residencies for two years. That was a good way because I didn't pay rent. Uh, I stopped paying back my student loans and didn't pay rent. That was helpful. Um, I you know, you can like apply for fellowships and there's all like little ways that you pull things together. I was freelancing, I was freelance book editing, so I've edited a bunch of both fiction and nonfiction books and sort of those were kind of tidying me over while I was doing my own work. Um, you know, this is the, the like big secret of, or not secret of being a writer is you're, most people are a writer and something else um, and finding the balance and carving out the space to do the work is a big part of figuring out how to be a writer. I actually wrote fiction all up until I went to grad school. Uh, it was not very good. <laughs> it was like, I could sort of see all the puppet strings. It was like, and now the character has feelings and you know, things would happen in these stories and I, 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 didn't, I didn't like them. I didn't like what I was writing. Um, and I went to, I was living in Ecuador. I lived in Ecuador for two years after college and I was writing these emails home and people had strange reactions to the emails that they were like, oh, this writing is really good. And I was like, no, it's not, it's an email. <laughs> like, this is not, this is just the stuff of life. And something sort of clicked in my head and I realized that like the material of the world could be the material one uses to write rather than like material that one invents to write. So um, the MFA program was the first time that I, and then I had this project, this traumatic brain injury project that I wanted to do. And so I applied with that project to MFA programs. And that was when I started writing nonfiction. That's a really good question because 
implicit in that question is also the acknowledgement that science is a culture, and this particular iteration of science is a very sort of Western culture. Um, and there are lots of other things that are science or that we can consider science that uh, are excluded from this culture. So uh, Stephen Shapin has a great definition of science um, that is in this encyclopedia. We were talking about this yesterday in class. It's in this encyclopedia of, um, I don't even know, I don't even remember what it was, terms, terms that have to do with science, something. And his entry was just science. And it's about three pages that sort of show that we don't actually know what science is. We don't have a definition of it. It's a thing that's changed over time. You know, does, does science include things like agriculture? Does science include things like Freudian psychology? Does science include things like, you know, traditional ecological knowledge that is, like sets of knowledges and ways of doing things that get passed between groups of people is like a really kind of rough way to think about science. But when, when you know, we, say science in sort of the United States and speaking from a certain cu kind of culture, we're, we're saying something that we think we know what we mean and it's actually just sort of the way that we're thinking about this set of knowledge at this particular moment in time. Um, so I'm very uh, like aware of that and the, the ways that it is conditional um, and problematic and also super interesting. <laughs> um, so you're talking about archives of knowledge. Um, Scientific papers, you know, that's its own kind of archive of knowledge, and I had to learn how to read scientific papers. I don't have training as a scientist, um, and so I had to, uh, you know, learn how to parse, like, what's a good, you know, n value, and how do the p-values get calculated, and, like, what, what does it mean to have, you know, a certain number of subjects in a study versus other subjects, and is this technology reliable, and how are we interpreting the data of this technology, and, like, where's the rest of the data from this, you know? Um, and also understanding that the scientific you know, canon of literature that we have in, of scientific papers is biased in its own particular ways that, you know, studies that don't, uh, that have a negative result don't get published. And so you have this real over, there's an, an overcompensation towards certain kinds of studies being published, um, you know, that that publishing culture is its own culture. And so that, that you know, archive is not flawless and is not objective. Um, and I think I'm constantly, I don't know if this answers your question, but like I'm constantly being skeptical of what I'm reading and how it was produced and where it was produced and why and under what culture constraints and with what money, with whose money, with whose blessing, <laughs> you know. Um, and that doesn't, that doesn't, you know, negate its power, it, but it, it, it complicates it. Um, does that answer your question? Okay. Other questions? I think the good news is it's probably easier now. Um, when I was an undergrad, I don't think I even knew that there was such a thing as science writing or you could be a science writer. And I, and I use that like moniker sort of gently. Like I, I can play one on TV if necessary, but I, like, I'm not sure that I totally uh, uh, fit that, that description um, in good ways and bad ways. Um, but when I was sort of coming up, I was just interested in questions that had to do with science and wanted to write about those things. Um, and I didn't have a journalism background either, so I didn't come from like the J school path, and I didn't come from the science path. I came from like the art path, which is like not a great path to arrive at science writing necessarily. Um, and it was really just through sort of trial and error by reporting and by researching and by not knowing what I was doing and asking stupid questions and sort of figuring out like what is what is science? What is this thing that everyone's talking about and thinking about? And um, like really just kind of trial and error. Um, and then once I had written a thing or two about science, people would come to me and, you know, editors would come to me asking me to write things about science because it seemed like I was a person who could do that. And so, you know, a lot of it is, is sort of, uh, you know, like faking confidence and, and pretending you can do a thing and then figuring out how to do it later. <laughs> uh, and then sort of surprising yourself and being like, oh, I, I guess I could write about science. I did that thing. Um, this is all very like abstract. It's not like year one, I did this, year two, I did that. Um, but now I think for people, there are specifically uh, science writing programs in inside of J school. So I know Columbia has a good one. NYU has one. Um, there are, CUNY has one, I think. Um, like I teach a class now for undergraduates um, around science and literature and how those like 
to how those things are kind of interacting in the history of science through literature. Um, th that didn't exist when I was a student, or I didn't know about it. Um, so it, it's becoming more and more a kind of career pathway thing that where there are resources for students who are interested in such things. Um, and I see, I see a lot of PhD students who do a PhD or do part of a PhD and decide they don't want to spend the rest of their life doing research, and it's a, it's a viable alternative option. And there are, you know, fellowship programs that, like, as a PhD student, you can apply for and try to sort of switch careers, you know, or if you have a PhD, you can go into, you know, particularly sort of science-specific journals and get some experience writing and then sort of leave those journals and go into more, you know, mainstream media if you want to. So there are a lot of ways to, to do that kind of writing, and there's a lot of demand for it. Um, spoiler alert, you're not going to get rich, <laughs> uh, but you can do the work. Um, I would recommend getting clips in other publications first. <laughs> Usually, if you're going to approach a, a national publication, you have to prove that you've done the kind of writing that you are proposing to do. Um, and it's a, you know, it's a little bit of a catch-22 circle, right? You can't do the thing until you've proven that you can do the thing. But you do it by starting smaller and starting in publications that will like, give you a chance. Every, every, everyone who's a writer ever had the first person who was like, give it a try. All right, let's see if you can do it. Um, so yeah, I think that's the answer. Yeah, you can pitch, you can cold, cold pitch. Um, a lot of, a good way to start is by writing for websites um, and potentially writing for free for websites because then you get clips built up. There was, you know, the sort of blogging bubble that happened where a lot of people were using their blogs as a way to then sort of launch themselves into a career um, in, in journalism, it was a, an easier move. I, f I feel like people are still doing that to some degree, and there are things like, you know, Medium where you can publish for free, um, so that you build up some kind of body of clips. I would say online, and probably don't expect to get paid too much to start out. Um, and then once you have a little bit of a body of work, you can, you know, point an editor toward it. And yeah, you write a letter and you say here's what I want to write about, I've read your publication, and here's why I think it's right for that publication. Um, you haven't covered this before, you did these other things that were sort of similar, but not the same. Um, here's why I'm the right person to write this. Here's the work that I've done already in reporting this. So like, if you're pitching a profile of a scientist, but you've never emailed that scientist before, <laughs> and you don't know if they're gonna agree to work with you, that's like not a great pitch to an editor. But if you have said, you know, I've been in contact with this scientist, their game to, you know, go ahead with this profile, would you be interested, right? So there's like different degrees of preparedness that you can signal to an editor. Um, yeah, there's like the art of the pitch letter. You can go online, there's a great database. Um, uh, of pitch letters on a website that I'm spacing on. Let's see if it comes to me eventually. But there, there are examples of pitch letters and ways to, to pitch online. Yeah. I think that most student scientists understand that as scientists, the thing they will do more than anything else, maybe even more than running experiments and running their lab, is writing. And their career is going to live or die on the basis of their ability to communicate their ideas to their peers, to journal editors, and to funders. And so they have an understanding that there's this skill here. I mean, most of the students that I teach, that I see in the PhD program, are more or less kind of open-minded, if not totally enthusiastic and excited about it. At least they're like, ah, I should know how to do this. <laughs> um, Sometimes there's resistance, you know. Sometimes there's there's people who think they already know how to write and don't want to do it, or people who you know don't see the value in it, and they're like, I'm just going to be brilliant, and everyone's going to throw money at me. But those those students are pretty rare. Um, there was another question. There was this. Oh, the foundational texts. Um, text for scientists. I think, in some ways, one one kind of I don't know gateway in for scientists is other scientists who write. Um, so that you don't have as much of that like cultural barrier. So you know things like Oliver Sacks or um, uh, Lewis Thomas or you know like those kinds of writers who are already speaking the language that those scientists speak, but communicating to a broader audience um, is often a way in. 
And there are some scientists who do amazing writing. You know, there's the uh, Primo Levi's The Periodic Table, and I mean, there's a lot of beautiful writing. I, I realize I just named three men. There's not as much of a canon of female scientists, in part because there's not as much of a canon of female scientists. Um, so that's something that I work, that I struggle with and work to find female scientists who are great writers. They're, they're out there. Other things? Okay, I think we're good. Yeah? Okay, thank you guys so much for coming. I really appreciate it.